Hello, hi, can you hear me? Some people, if you will need to connect to their audio and in the very beginning, they can unmute their microphones. Soon after that, we will start our actual online session, learning session about acute coronary syndrome and its complications. My name is Tsanku. I'm uh, one of the, I'm one of the NHS doctors that will be teaching you today. We are going to we are going to discuss this topic as part of the program of Plavverse. Let me just see if every, if everybody can can hear me properly and see how many participants are on the screen at the moment. Right. So I have a confirmation that we can work together. We can work straight away. Okay. So I'm going to start with sharing some screen. Then I'll say a few words about myself. What do I do? What kind of specialties I do? And how basically everything started. Given the restriction that we have, unfortunately, only 45 minutes. So I'll try to be as strict as possible. I'll try to give you the base idea of all the conditions and topics that we are discussing at this time. Because to be completely honest, um, acute coronary syndrome is a condition which can which we can basically discuss for literally ages and we have so many things to say about them for for the uh, for all the let me see if i can do it this way yeah for all the possible complications and everything that can actually happen right so let's increase this right so as I said from the very beginning, my name is Tsanku. I'm an NHS doctor working in emergency medicine in a couple of major hospitals in the United Kingdom. Uh, from the very beginning of this uh, lecture, I would like to say that I started working as an emergency medicine doctor since 2015. And since 2020, I am also a certified nutritionist. Um, I run my own uh, social media as well on YouTube for different medical conditions, which you can feel free to join as well, where I will be actually uploading a copy of this uh, video, of this lecture. There will be a copy of the whole video presentation on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Online Medicine for All Patients. It specializes in, um, in video production about medical conditions that are mainly directed towards patients. So all the medical information is explained in a simplified way so everybody actually can understand what I'm talking about in these, for these conditions. Also, apart from medical conditions, I discuss different nutrition tactics, sport programs and regimens and all these kind of stuff so we can treat and prevent further deterioration or development of certain medical conditions. As you can see on the screen, this is a very, very short presentation for myself done by Plapverse. Also, you can see on the screen over here, um, this is um, the logo of the company for which I work as an emergency doctor. This is called ED Staffing. Very nice company, very reliable one. And one day when you join NHS, you can feel free to sign up with them. And on the right hand side, you can see the logo of my YouTube channel, also Facebook page for online medicine, where I will upload a copy of this video when we finish with the whole lecture at the moment. Right, let's dive into the topic so we can uh, we can discuss what we are going actually to speak about. So this is a table of contents. Number one, I have put the cardiac emergencies. These are the most common cardiac emergencies that uh, uh, we can discuss in this uh, in this lecture. Um, there are there are different conditions that actually can bring a patient to emergency department, and the heart attack is not the only one, unfortunately. And there are numerous cardiac emergencies. However, because this is a very large topic, I would like to mention from the very beginning, from the outset, that 
we can make further lectures if there is any interest about this, about the different cardiac emergencies, and we can go much deeper in the topic and we can discuss even more about them because right now we'll, we are slightly restricted and we will need to cover mainly the acute coronary syndrome. And further to that, we will need to just mention the most common emergencies. Then on the second point, I will discuss ACS. What is the ACS? What is the acute coronary syndrome? As you can see, number three, presentation and diagnosis, which means clinical symptoms uh, and the most relevant information when it comes to diagnostic measures and procedures in ACS in MI. Also ACS management. So how do we treat the two most common types of ACS, which is STEMI and NSTEMI? What are the differences and how do we dif differentiate both conditions? We will also discuss in number five, the post, the post heart attack management. This is the pharmacological management. We'll discuss the medications that we can give to patients and what we can do to help these people recover as quicker as possible. And the final point, as you can see on your screen, is number six is the ACS and complications. Unfortunately, after myocardial infarction, there are numerous of complications that can occur. So that's what we are going to discuss, and that's what we are going to try to prevent in the future. All right, let's dive into the topic now. Please, or if you just mute your microphones, just in case, so we can have a nice and good lecture and we can discuss this easily. Right, I can see that everybody is already muted. So number one, we are going to mention the most common cardiac emergencies that can come to the emergency department. I'm sorry for this. This is a very quick differential diagnosis of acute chest pain. So what reason, what is the main reason, the main medical reason for the development of chest pain and why we should be always very vigilant when we are uh, assessing a patient with chest pain. Uh, we should uh, definitely check what's the beginning, the onset of the chest pain. We should ask about many, many, many um, different things about the chest pain that can actually lead us to the possible diagnosis. In this case, as you can see, the most common causes of chest pain are MI, which is myocardial infarction, or as we can, or as we were going, we are going to speak in a bit about acute coronary syndrome, pericarditis, aortic dis dissection, GORD, yes, it's a very mild, well, like, let's say it's not serious at all as a reason for chest pain. However, it brings patients, even over the night, at three o'clock in the morning, with symptoms of chest pain due to GORD, so gastroesophageal reflux disease. And then we, we can see here on the screen about P, which is pulmonary embolism pneumothorax, the development of pneumonia or any kind of chest infection, so lower or the upper way airways involvement. And another common reason for chest pain is the MSK pain, which is musculoskeletal pain. I'm just going to move this over here, right? So let's discuss about the most common cardiac emergencies that you can meet in the emergency department. So number one, I have put heart failure, which could be acute or chronic. Uh, the main symptoms that can bring patient to emergency department with heart failure are acute breathlessness, uh, any kind of orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dys dyspnea, uh, also fluid retention, which most likely will come as anchoedema. Uh, another common symptom for acute or uh, chronic heart failure with acute exacerbation actually is um, the fatigue, the, the feeling of tiredness, and also very important, reduced exercise tolerance. So if people are saying that they can walk less and they become even more breathless, especially with swelling of the peripheral limbs, always think about the possibility of having a heart failure. And sometimes people explain and report about uh, recurrent syncopes or episodes of dizziness, lightheadedness, all these things alongside chest pains can be a cause of heart failure as well and a symptom 
uh, leading well coming from actual heart failure. Doesn't matter if it's acute heart failure or chronic heart failure with acute exacerbation. In every case scenario, we treat it exactly the same way, high priority. That's why it is classified as cardiac emergency on the go. The patients can literally come just like this and end up in massive heart failure. So we need to be staying vigilant about this. The next one, just trying to... Acute pericarditis. Acute pericarditis is another common condition which brings patients with symptoms of acute sharp stabbing central chest pain, uh, which can radiate to both shoulders or even to the upper arms. Um, the chest pain may be pleuritic in, um, in nature, may be pleuritic in character and can be relieved. This is very important for differentiation of chest pains, of the chest pain, sorry. Uh, in acute pericarditis, the pain relieves when people sit forward. If they lie down, the pain gets significantly worse and they can't tolerate the lying position on the trolley. Also, the chest pain in acute pericarditis is uh, often worsened by deep breath, so inspiration. As I said, lying flat, worsening during cough, also during swallowing, which is a differentiation in pleuritic, which I mean in non-cardiac sounding and cardiac sounding chest pain. So swallowing doesn't cause any kind of worsening of the non-cardiac sounding chest pain. And also in acute pericarditis, that's why it's so tricky, this condition, the pain can get worse when we move our trunk as well, like our body. On body movement, the pain can get worse. The pericardial friction rub is basically the, um, um, the pathognomonic um, sign here. Often when you ask your data patient, a rub can be hurt even when, uh, even when pericardial eff effusion is actually present. So the rubbing is actually very, very, very common in this situation. We need to look for that. There are numerous reasons for this, but if you would like me to get deep into this, to, to, to dive into this as well, and to share some more future projects about this, just let us know. You can ask questions in the end of the, in the, end of the session. You will see some questions in the end as well. So you can ask me anything and I will be more than happy to provide further training for you. Num number three is infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis, is one of the common reasons for uh, the development of chest pain. The main symptoms and clinical signs that you can actually uh, develop in infective endocarditis is fever plus the development of new murmur, which is basically equal to the development and the, the presentation of endocarditis until proven otherwise. So we need to suspect endocarditis in any fever chest pain and the development of heart murmur on auscultation, which can be heard loudly and properly. The main reasons for the development of infective endocarditis are, uh, of, co um, of course, it's the staphylococcus um, aureus, uh, which is very common, especially in uh, emergency departments. And in subacute infective endocarditis, one of the most common reasons is the streptococcus bacteria viridans. Of course, as you know already, the main reasons or predisposition factors for the development of infective endocarditis are uh, basically valve replacement, um, recreational drug abuse like um, IV, IV drugs as well of any kind, and very common, unfortunately, after intervention, interventions with your own dentist. Right, number four is ECG arrhythmias. So the ECG arrhythmias is a very, very large topic for discussion. However, I'm going to mention a few of the most common um, cardiac arrhythmias that actually bring patients in the emergency department and that you can actually see in the emergency department. The most common, most likely, is actually atrial fibrillation, so AFib or AF. This often brings patients to the emergency department with symptoms of palpitation, lightheadedness, 
they feel that their heart is racing in a very fast pace actually and sometimes but more um, more unlikely to be honest is the dyspnea so shortness of breath uh, another common condition that can actually bring patients in the emergency department is atrial flutter. Uh, atrial flutter is uh, more described as a fluttering feeling in the chest that actually symptoms uh, that actually patients point to, and this is um, most likely this is at a very very transient stage between the normal sinus rhythm and the actual development of atrial fibrillation. Uh, another common reason, another common ECG arrhythmia uh, that you can see in emergency department uh, is ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, ventricular fibrillation most of the times is um, with sudden collapse. Uh, patients are not breathing as well. So basically we start the management, uh, we, we start CPR management as per the protocol of the adult or pediatric life support guidances so basically that's what we do with uh, fibrio, uh, ventricular fibrillation and the management is basically cpr in ventricular tachycardia it really depends on the condition but yes it's a common cardiac arrhythmia ecg arrhythmia that you can see um, in uh, on the street in emergency department and another common reason is the sinus tachycardia. Numerous reasons for sinus tachycardia. When we investigate sinus tachycardia, we need to basically dive into so many topics in this case. But let's mention initially uh, any cardiac pathology. We need to uh, check the level of steroid hormones. Uh, we need to check the thyroid hormones. We need to provide a full 24 to 48 hour state of the cardiac rhythm so we can assess what exactly the underlying pathology is. And hard blocks, all the hard blocks like type 1 hard block, which is with prolonged PR interval over, over new 0.2 seconds. Um, another one very uh, is the type 2 actually, which is called Movis type 1. Um, this is a progressive prolongation of the PR interval. Then Movis type 2, which is a sudden drop of the, of the QRS uh, complex without any prior PR changes. And in type three, which is most likely the worst one, to be honest, um, this is P waves and QR complexes are completely not related um, to each other. And this basically messes the heart rhythm and brings to quite significant body arrhythmia. Patients always go to recess and it's a challenging experience, to be honest. Wolf Parkinson White syndrome and uh, basically the sinus bradycardia are more uncommon conditions, uh, especially as, as initial presentation in the AE. But still, you can, you can see them and you can find them, especially the sinus bradycardia, by the way, is very common in young people, especially who practice regular exercise and sports activities. So don't get stressed if you see this in the future. And that's what you should mention actually for your exam as well, uh, because this, these are the, the, the most common conditions when it comes to ECG arrhythmias. Then number five is the valvular heart disease. So this is, um, this is something that you can actually see in emergency departments uh, quite commonly, to be honest. Um, and you should always stay alert about this. You should always listen to the chest of, um, of patients. You should, you should always try to assess the valvular system. The most common uh, valvular disease in, in the heart is the aortic stenosis. I actually believe that this is the most common diagnostic um, diagnosis when it comes to uh, valvular heart disease in the United Kingdom. Um, the causes are mainly the genetic, the uh, degenerative um, uh, sclerotic changes to the valves. I think that someone is trying to say something because one of the microphones is getting unmuted all the time. Let's see if someone will say something. No, okay. And then the congenital bicuspid aortic uh, valve, um, which is mainly in younger people. Another common 
valve or heart disease that you can see and you need to know is the mit uh, mitral regurgitation. This is the second most common heart valve disorder, uh, which can be diagnosed in the UK, commonly associated as, uh, with um, inferior uh, myocardial infarction, infarction rather than actually anterior. And it's usually seen as a complication two to 10 days post um, the development of acute coronary syndrome. And possibly sometimes it can present with some pulmonary edema as well. Another one is the mitral valve um, prolapse, which is inheritable connective disorder, tissue disorder, uh, and it could be associated with Marfan's and Echlidanos syndrome, also with osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, most patients are actually asymptomatic uh, most of the times, and most of the times they get diagnosed by accidents during Sorry. regular during regular hello is someone trying to to get involved in the conversation because i can see that one of the microphones keeps switching on all the time let me see i'm trying to find no i can't find anyone okay i'll continue then uh so the i was talking about the mvp so the mitral valve pro uh prolapse um, it's a very classic case in uh, very slim, especially young female patients um, with normally um, significantly lower blood pressure. The signs are basically mid-systolic click that you can hear on auscultation, best heard at the fifth intercostal space uh, to the left mid-clavicular line. Uh, also, um, you can um, uh, you can notice that it's followed by a mid or late systolic murmur, uh, with finding accentuated in the um, accentuated in the standing position of the body. Another common valvular heart disease is the mitral stenosis. Uh, it's most commonly as a complication of rheumatic uh, fever. Uh, it impedes left ventricular filling, basically, uh, which leads to increased blood volume in the left atrium, which on the other side leads to increased left atrial pressure, and therefore it leads, it makes actually the blood to be coming back to the lungs, co causing significant pulmonary congestion and obviously edema which can actually lead to further deterioration to the second, which is a secondary uh, pulmonary, uh, which is basically caused by a secondary pulmonary uh, uh, vasoconstriction. constriction. Therefore, the uh, development of pulmonary hypertension, and this can actually become um, um, really difficult for, for the right ventricle to pump. And this leads to the development of right ventricular failure. So this is um, this is a condition uh, that uh, can bring patients with uh, symptoms of swelling, deterioration in their mobility, shortness of breath, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, ascites as well. So retention of fluids under uh, retention of fluids. Uh, peripheral edema in, in the peripheral uh, limbs as well. So many, many, many other symptoms that can basically go alongside the right ventricular failure. Another uh, valve of your heart disease that I would like to mention is aortic regurgitation. This condition uh, is uh, mainly caused as a well developed as a complication of infective endocarditis and Marfan's syndrome. The main signs on actual examination are the development, and you're going to be able actually to find the early diastolic murmur, which is best heard at the left sternal edge. Uh, it's also coin, uh, called uh, point of herb or herbs point. Uh, long time ago, I remember that the previous classification was called as Botkin herb uh, point, but nowadays we just use the herbs point. 
Another one that I would like to mention the valve from the uh, from the topic about valve or heart diseases is cardiac emergencies is the pulmonary stenosis. Uh, another one is the ventricular septal defect, which I'm going to mention very briefly because I would like to move down to the main topic for today, which is the ACS. Uh, and the management. And of course, I need to mention the patent ductus arteriosus, which actually can be found very commonly in patients, especially here in the UK. Uh, the num number six in my list is cyanosis. The main causes of cyanosis, cardiac emergencies, is the tetralogia fallow transposition of the great. Uh, of the great arteries in the body, tricuspid atresia, which is pans, which is uh, which is identified identified as a pansystolic murmur, plus the development plus the development of generalized cyanosis over the body, most likely immediately after birth. And um, another one that I would like to mention as a cause of cyanosis is truncus arteriosus and the total. Um, anomaly of the pulmonary venous connection known as TAPVC. Right. Hypertension, of course, another cardiac emergency, which you can see quite commonly actually in emergency departments nowadays. Uh, many people are going with not well controlled high blood pressures, which can bring some, some systemic symptoms like lightheadedness or, or dizziness. Uh, some of them are feeling chest pain, feeling generally unwell with some headache, especially on the posterior side over the occipital area. Uh, this type of headache is getting worse when they lean forward. So HTN is a classic uh, condition that you can see in ANE. The new guidelines are saying that people with presentation of high blood pressure, unless there are systemic symptoms, should not be treated and should be investigated first before the actual treatment commences. However, sometimes people with very high blood pressure, systemic symptoms as well, are not getting better in emergency department with the baseline treatment. So if the blood pressure is not improving by treatment in a matter of one to two hours of observations, this is referred as malignant hypertension, which needs further investigations, IV management and admission under the local general medicine team for further investigations. And now, Let's go to the main topic of um, today's lecture. This is acute coronary syndrome. And I will start with some general description of this condition. Very briefly, acute coronary syndrome, as you can see on your screen, is, is a face or actually uh, a face in which there is a significant occlusion in the blood supply to the heart. This is used to describe a variety of different disorders that are linked to the actual rapid reduction in the amount of blood that goes to the heart. Myocardial infarction, uh, or also referred in the basically in the spoken language as heart attack, is a very, very common condition, unfortunately. One of the main causes of the development of chest pain and needs to be investigated. Obviously, I'm not going to read what's written already on the screen. You can always have a look at it. As I said, there will be a copy of this whole session on my YouTube channel, so you can always go back and watch it. Also, Clubverse will be providing further um, ways for you to access this online lecture. So I'm not going to read what's written on the screen. I'm going to, I'm going to leave this to you, but most, yeah, you already know most of this information, so I'm going to go straight to the uh, main idea of ACS, which is irreversible death of heart tissue. And well, there are some differences that while angina is chest pain due to temporary ischemia, uh, this means that the heart tissue is still alive 
in myocardial infarction, we don't have this case. So then we, we, we start develop, uh, the development of uh, localized ischemia after the occlusion and further necrosis, which can lead to further deterioration and development of heart failure. Uh, in uh, subendocardial um, infarct, also can be referred as um, uh, non STEMI or N STEMI. Uh, it normally affects about 20 to 40 millimeters. Uh, transmural infarct or cardiac ischemia is when the whole wall thickness is involved. And this could be actually bringing the second type of cardiac of um, myocardial infarction STEMI, so ST elevation myocardial infarction and non-STEMI or N-STEMI is basically non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Another common condition that can be um, re referred and can lead actually to development of acute coronary syndrome is stable angina, which is basically a chronic condition on and off, on and off can be causing sharp stabbing, severe chest pain with cardiac origin and can be relieved by rest and some simple medications like painkillers or some GTN spray, etc. And another condition that I would like to mention is the unstable angina. Unstable angina doesn't respond to rest and medications. Most of the times the ECG could be normal. And basically this, this condition is quite nasty. So it needs further investigations because it brings chest pain. Most of the times all the diagnostic measures are negative for heart attack and it still could be unstable angina, which needs to be treated as acute STEMI, as, uh, as a suspected acute myocardial infarction. So let's discuss the presentation. So what the patient, the patients can come with, let's say an emergency department and how are we going to put the diagnosis? What are we going to use about this? So in this, in this slide, I'm going to discuss exactly this, the presentations and diagnosis in ED. So the presentation, as you can see, it's a typical, well, the typical actually presentation is um, chest pain, which is cardiac sounding, central epigastric radiating to, let's say, the left shoulder, upper arm, sometimes can be going down to the left arm with, um, it can be described as uh, substernal pressure, um, squeezing type of uh, chest pain, also dull ache normally from uh, on the pain scale from zero, where zero is no pain at all and then it's excruciating. People often say five or six is more like a dull ache rather than anything else. Or sometimes they even describe it as burning pain, which is why many people actually get uh, diagnosed with GORD because most of the times the pain, the burning pain comes with GORD, but still cardiac involvement needs to be excluded. In anyone, according to the NICE guidelines, in anyone above the age of 30, presenting to emergency department with non-traumatic chest pain needs to be assessed by senior doctor or at least discussed with a senior doctor. So cardiac involvement should be definitely excluded. Same, of course, for pulmonary embolism, but we will discuss this a little bit later. Um, also, as I said, the chest pain can be radiating to the shoulder, neck, jaw, upper arm. Uh, sometimes chest pain can come with diaphoresis, so an ex like sympathetic, sim uh, sympathetic um, activity coming with excessive sweating, um, nausea, sometimes with vomiting, sometimes with um, shortness of breath and generalized feeling of generalized tiredness, actually. Uh, not very common, but still one of the presentations for, um, for uh, ACS is the development of palpitations. Therefore, we should always assess the cardiac ischemic level by which I'm going to discuss in a little bit how we assess this when patients present with palpitations, shortness of breath, chest pain, anything like this. And um, yeah, as I explained, GI symptoms, respiratory. So the atypical presentation, uh, the atypical presentations are um, 
actually mainly tend to be seen in women uh, and older men, uh, also with people with diabetes and people from the ethnic minorities. Uh, these atypical symptoms uh, can include um, abdominal discomfort, um, can also uh, include any kind of just isolated jaw pain, which comes basically from nowhere and patients are worried. Also, most of the times they present actually with acute delirium or altered mental state, which needs further investigation. So in my experience, in my practice, when I work in the emergency department, whenever I see a patient with diabetes or elderly with some kind of confusion, I always assess the, I always assess the cardiac state because we must ensure that the cause of the delirium is not some hidden heart attack, which can lead to further deterioration, as we're going to discuss in a bit the post-MI complications, especially untreated like acute heart failure and many, many, many others. So this needs to be excluded. Uh, when it comes to the diagnosis, of course, when it comes to chest pain, the first thing that people need to get when um, coming to emergency department is ECG. There are three possible scenarios that we can see when we assess patient with chest pain. The first one is STEMI, ST elevation, myocardial infarction, or non-STEMI, which means non-ST elevation, myocardial infarction. And we can actually see a completely normal ECG, uh, a completely normal heart rate, but sometimes they just present with sinus bradycardia and the feeling of tiredness, especially elderly patients. So when we approach a patient with chest pain, when the patient attends the emergency department or your clinic or anywhere, the first thing that you need to do is to conduct an ECG to assess the base rhythm and see if there is any obvious cardiac ischemia going on at this time. Trust me, guys, this is a lifesaver. If you see the STEMI, we'll discuss the management in a second, literally just in a bit. This is saving people's lives all the time. You don't have to wait for path lab results. You don't have to wait for troponin results. You don't have to wait for anything. If you have visible acute STEMI, you can discuss with the cardiology team. And as the ALS protocols are saying, time in this case is a muscle when it comes to the recovery and successful recovery of patients with acute myocardial infarction. When it comes to the cardiac markers, so what do we assess when a patient attends a &E with acute chest pain? Of course, I'm going to mention the two main priority blood results that you need to check. This is the troponin level and the creatinine kinase MB fraction. However, I need to say that further to this, we can investigate full blood count using knees and the CRP as well, the cardiac enzymes or cardiac markers as well. So we can automatically confirm or exclude or suspect any possible reason for this chest pain like infection or anything like this but obviously when we speak about acs especially if there are no ecg changes and there is especially cardiac sounding chest pain troponin and ck mb fracture needs to be assessed and checked via the path lab so troponin which is taken less than three hours for the symptoms onset, most likely needs to be repeated, especially if there is ongoing chest pain. However, if the troponin result for less than three hours is over 30 nanograms per liter, with or without any ECG changes, needs to be treated as a suspected acute coronary syndrome. If the result is less than 12, nanograms per liter, we need to repeat the troponin three hours after the first troponin was taken. Yes, absolutely. You can feel free to, to, to record the lecture. I've just received a message on the screen. So yeah, absolutely, you can record. You can record the lecture, of course. Uh, when it comes to the 
CKMB fraction, so the creatinine kinase, it's very actually important as well because it's a very, very sensitive marker when it, when, when it comes to cardiac ischemia. It always comes, comes back positive or at least it can lead us into the possible diagnosis. Um, also, CKMB is much better than troponin when it, when it comes for detection of reinfarction sites of the heart with rapid rise or, or and fall. Let's talk about the management of ACS. Sometimes, as I'm practicing emergency medicine for quite a while now, I can say that this is very tricky. And actually, uh, management of ACS can be very challenging as well at the same time. So when it comes to patients with chest pain, we must ensure that people, one of the main principles of emergency medicine practice is to treat pain. No patient in the emergency department should feel any kind of pain. So we need to ensure that we treat this pain in a timely manner. So to reduce the agitation, the anxiety from the possible heart attack whilst investigating, unless it's straightforward on the ECG, we need to apply also the, the well-known principle, principle of MONA. So M as morphine, IV, to reduce agitation or anything like this. Oxygen to substitute the loss of oxygen going to the cardiac muscle. Nitrate, which is most likely GTN uh, as a sublingual or IV application to increase the lumen of the cardiac vessels and to help the supply of blood to the restricted area. And always, please always load your patients with 300 milligrams of aspirin. It's very beneficial, very helpful, and extremely important in the reduction of the possible complications and the successful outcome of the treatment for ACS. Also, alongside, as, I, as you will see just in a bit, um, you can give some more medications, but let's dive into the STEMI because we are running a little bit out of time, but let's dive into the STEMI. If you see a patient with ST elevation and the chest pain has started within 12 hours of the time that you actually assess the patient, uh, and if you are able to conduct, to conduct percutaneous coronary intervention known as PCI within two hours, so 120 minutes, you must proceed with this. You need to get in touch with the cardiology registrar on call or consultant or whoever cardiologist is on call, and you must ensure that the patient is en route to the local cat lab so they can fully remove the negative effects of this, of this clot in the, uh, in the arterial supply of the heart. And second option is thrombolysis with alteplase or streptokinase. This is only in case that the PCI for any reason cannot be conducted, cannot be delivered within the 120 minutes. And the chest pain is with a longer onset than 12 hours from the time you assess the patient and the actual um, start time of the chest pain. When it comes to non-STEMI, or NSTEMI, uh, we need to start with some medications, with some treatment with oral aspirin, as I have explained in the very beginning from the mono management. So aspirin 300, clopidogrel 300 milligrams, or ticag ticagrelor 180 milligrams to provide a proper anti aggregant uh, or anti-platelet uh, effect. And always remember, low molecular weight heparin, extremely important. So different trusts nowadays use different medications, but the most common are fundaparin, oxenoxaparin, and dautaparin. Very important for the successful recovery of heart attack or NSTEMI. And final option, of course, is the coronary angioplasty, as you can see on your screen. And 
you can of course always proceed with the of course this is a cardiology decision but if you become cardiologist in the uk you will be able to take the relevant decision if the patient requires coronary artery bypass graft or what actually kind of management it will be after we start the initial management in the emergency department so what do we do if the troponin is absolutely normal? So the cardiac markers are normal. There are no ECG changes, but the patient still has ongoing, ongoing cardiac sounding chest pain. This is the last part of the ACS, which I would like to discuss that can be leading to the development of chest pain. And this is the unstable angina. So unstable angina needs to be treated urgently, needs to be treated as a suspected acute heart attack, regardless of the fact that there is no actual sign on the ECG and that the troponin levels in the blood in the peripheral blood are absolutely normal. As I said, I'm not going to repeat everything that is written on the screen. You can do this for yourself. Um, you, can, you can read the whole information. Uh, but the main diagnosis, differential diagnosis that needs to be suspected when the troponin is normal and there are no ECG changes with ongoing chest pain is the Prince metal angina and unstable angina. And further advice about this uh, should be given. Um, you should start the management as per acute and STEMI protocol with dual antiplatelet therapy with the application sometimes of nitrates with the application of uh, depends on the blood pressure and the hemodynamical and uh, the hemodynamical stability stability of the patient and also you can um, you can apply well you need to apply the low molecular weight heparin when it comes to post acs management it's very important so we can ensure that the patient does not develop any further complication Duo antiplatelets, aspirin is normally a lifelong, so they, people take it forever after heart attack as a further prevention. And clopidogrel can be taken for up to a year, uh, or it can be increased to a lifelong therapy if required. It's always discussed with the cardiology team, so, and staff investigation is conducted before that. Uh, beta blockers. Um, when it comes to beta blockers, um, they need to be started as soon as the patient is hemodynamically stable. When there are no signs of heart failure at all, beta blockers um, should be started uh, for, for a period of at least one year after the myocardial infarction. If there are signs of heart failure, uh, people should take beta blockers, the same as aspirin, as a lifelong therapy. Other medications that can be applied in, in the post-ACS management are ACE, ARB inhibit, inhibitors, statins. The classic treatment is atorvastatin 80 milligrams as a lifelong treatment. Uh, if people are intolerant to the ACE inhibitors, we apply then the ARB inhibitors. What are the most common complications of ACS? How do we recognize them? I will give you a few ideas how to get orientated quickly. And then we will dive into the questions and answers, answers area. And you can ask me anything in the end of the lecture. So the complications of MI, we need to start by discussing the papillary muscle rupture. Please remember that post-MI, if you detect any kind of complications, always remember this one, papillary muscle rupture, in the first three to five days time after the MI. This is basically a mechanical type of complication from MI, which leads from myocardial infarction, which leads to life-threatening necrosis of the heart muscle and of the surrounding tissue around the heart attack area. Um, this leads to acute severe um, uh, mitral regurgitation with pansystolic murmur and auscultation at the apex of the heart. And the, um, you can also detect that it's radiating to the axilla. 
So very important, remember three to five days after the heart attack is papillary muscle rupture. Dressler's syndrome is basically uh, the second autoimmune form of pericarditis uh, that occur after, uh, after acute heart attack. It normally starts one week to several months after MI. So very important if the complications of heart attack start between seven days and several months always suspect the possibility of Dressler's syndrome. The main symptoms are fever, pleuritic type of chest pain with pericardio and pleural effusion, especially very well visible on a chest X-ray. The main treatment is NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease. And because patients who are developing this kind of um, uh, post-MI complication, I always advise to, for the application of proton pump inhibitor PPI, which is omeprazole, and soprazole, pantoprazole, and many, many other medications like this. Number three is the ventricular aneurysm. Uh, this is as well a, med a condition um, uh, classified as a complication of MI, always comes after MI and it's between four to six weeks after MI. So very important to remember this, the discounts of, in, in a period of four to six weeks after MI with some classical ECG changes. I will give you an actual example with a patient from emergency departments that came a long time ago and we were, we were able to see. So you will be able to see uh, what I'm talking about, but I'm going to mention that the main uh, that the main ECG changes during the ventricular aneurysm is persistent ST elevation with symptoms and signs of left ventricular failure. So all these types of shortness of breath, deteriorating mobility, chest pains on and off are all classic for this with cardiomegaly on x-ray, with abnormal bulge at the left heart border. I always advise, if you suspect ventricular aneurysm, always refer the patient to cardiology for further investigation with echo, uh, which is basically ultrasound for the heart. And another complication of MI that I would like to mention is the left bundle branch block. The reason why I'm putting this in a separate category is because we should be extremely careful when we assess people with left bundle branch block on the ECG alongside chest pain. The left bundle branch block develops as a delayed effect of, um, well, as an effect of delayed left ventricular activation, which further to that leads to left ventricle, uh, which, which leads the left ventricle to start contracting later uh, than the actual right ventricle. So there is some kind of deterioration in the normal cycle of contraction in the heart chambers. As you can see on your screen down there, we need to discuss the RSR pattern, VS RS pattern for right bundle and left bundle branch block. So you can remember this and whenever you see it, you will know what's going on. So let's go into the left bundle branch. Uh, so left bundle branch is classified as left bundle branch is classified as changes in V1. So this one over here, can you see it? This is the RS pattern. And in V6, you have the R pattern over here. Also, a very quick trick will be, if you imagine that this ECG is right in front of you, let's say that this is, this is your ECG strip. So this is your ECG strip here. If you see this pattern and you turn the ECG to the left, 
if the QRS complex points to the left in V1, you can classify as left bundle branch. If it points to the right, you can classify as RBB because most of the time the right bundle branch in V1, as you can see on your screen, will come as RSR pattern on the ECG in V1, in the first central chest lead. There is also a classification called Willem Marrow. So for the Willem Marrow, it is very helpful to determine the difference between left and right bundle branch block. Willem means that V1 looks like W uh, in left bundle branch and V6 looks like M. So that's why it is Willem. And the other one, Marrow, means that V1 looks like the letter M in V1 and V6 looks like W. That's why it's called Marrow. This is a very easy way to remember this change on the ECG. And very important, as I said, to always check old notes or anything like this if the left bundle branch block is new and if you need to treat it, treat it further. And one last thing that you must remember is the left bundle branch block, which I already explained. As per policy for six to 12 hours troponin, this needs to be assessed. If the left bundle branch is not new and the troponin after 12 hours is normal from the onset of chest pain, then you can start looking for different causes of the chest pain in the patient. But if there is no evidence, if there is no evidence in your system, in your old notes, when you ask the nurse in charge or the receptionist to help you with this, if there is no evidence of old left bundle branch block in this patient, you need to start investigations as per the STEMI protocol, as per the ST elevation, ST elevation myocardial infarction protocol and you need to discuss with cardiologist as soon as possible. So let's dive into the questions. Um, these are all clinical scenarios that I would like to discuss with yourself. Yes, exactly. Like I've just seen a message coming on the screen. We're running a little bit out of time, but yes, I will type down the YouTube channel that you can find it and Plapverse will be able to provide you a copy of this lecture as well if you need it. Otherwise, online medicine for all patients will have a copy of this lecture when we finish with this. And you can also discuss with the administration team in Plapverse, but let's, let's discuss this in 30 seconds, literally. So 45-year-old manual worker presented with a two-hour history of chest pain radiating to his left arm. His ECG is completely normal, so normal sinus rhythm. What is the single most appropriate investigation that you, 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 need, to do? you need to do? So this gentleman presents the... Uh, manual, actually, we don't know if it's a, a, a female or male patient in this clinical scenario. But anyway, um, this 45-year-old patient presents with two hours history of chest pain, which radiates to the left arm, most likely cardiac sounding chest pain. The first most appropriate investigation is ECG, which is already given in our question. So this means that the first most appropriate investigation is conducted to confirm or exclude STEMI or NSTEMI. What is the next one? In this case, it will be the assessment of cardiac enzymes to see what is the level of ongoing cardiac ischemia in this case. Right, a 48 year old patient presents with severe chest pain since the last 40 minutes. In the emergency department, he's given oxygen, GTN, morphine. Uh, there is clear ST elevation on ECG. 
So the bloods show rapidly increased troponin levels. What is the next step? So if you remember from the STEMI protocol, if you have ST elevation, myocardial infarction, ECG, the first and the most important thing that you need to do whilst prescribing oxygen, GTN, and morphine is you need to ring the local cardiology team and refer the patient for percutaneous angiography. This is the most important next step, especially if the patient, if you remember, is within 12 hours period of the onset of chest pain, which in this case is for 40 minutes. And if we are able to conduct the PCI and geography basically within 120 minutes or two hours. Right, a 55 year old man returns for routine follow up six weeks after an MI. He gets breathless when walking uphill. His ECG shows ST elevation in leads V1, V2, V3, V4. So only this part is more than enough to know six weeks after an MI. Patient gets breathless with changes in V1, V2, V3, V4. The most important diagnosis that you need to suspect in this way is the left ventricular aneurysm, as we discussed a few minutes ago. Very important to be explained very well to the patient and all the relevant investigations to be conducted. Question number four is a 74-year-old lady with, uh, who is calling an ambulance for acute chest pain. Sorry, I'll move my camera because I can't see the questions properly. Uh, who called an ambulance for acute onset of chest pain. So 74-year-old with history of diabetes mellitus and hypertension and heavy smoker. Paramedics mentioned that she was overweight and recently was immobile so not able to move because of hip pain. She collapsed and died, unfortunately, in the ambulance. What is the single most common cause for death in this case? Obviously, in this case, we are talking about 74-year-old female patient, so higher risk with diabetes, even more, with acute chest pain worsening. So it's more than enough for you to start investigations in a female in a patient if they're female, elderly, with history of diabetes. This is more than enough to conduct investigations for um, acute heart attack, or for acute myocardial infarction. But if they already have acute chest pain, this is even higher risk for the development of MI, especially with cardiac history, which is in this case, the hypertension. And heavy smoker obviously brings further deterioration, further risk for the development of pulmonary embolism. MI, stroke, all the cardiac arrhythmias that we discussed, and generalized cardiac failure with acute onset. However, there is something tricky in this question, and you need to always stay very vigilant about this. Recently immobile, so recent immobilization with acute chest pain is very suggestive as well for pulmonary embolism, because if you look at the well score, this will mean that this patient is in a higher risk, especially as a hypertension, heavy smoker and diabetes, she will be in a very high risk for the development of deep, deep venous thrombosis, therefore development of pulmonary embolism. However, because we have something to follow up here, uh, she collapsed and died in the ambulance. The most common cause of sudden hemodynamical deterioration is when there is acute occlusion in the cardiac vascular supply. So the correct answer in this case will be MI. <clears throat> and number five is another is the last um, clinical scenario that we are going to discuss, given the complications of MI that we discussed already. 55-year-old woman suffers from acute myocardial infarction five days ago. So five days ago, she had a heart attack, this, this patient, 55-year-old. She's presenting now to the hospital with features of pulmonary edema and heart failure. What is the most probable cause? So if you go back in the past few minutes to the most common complications of heart attack, you will see that in the first three to five days time, 
the ruptured papillary muscle is one of the most common complications which brings patients back after MI. So in this case, with pulmonary edema features and heart failure, all this brings to, uh, leads to the diagnosis of ruptured papillary muscle. That was from me today for today for, for your topic for cardiac emergencies and management of ACAs, which is brought to you by Plapverse Academy. Plapverse Academy is, as you can see on your screen, a two months live interactive online course where you will be guided by NHS doctors who obtained registration to the PLAP protocol and route. And we're going to be giving you the best opportunity to pass on your first attempt in the exam. As you can see on the screen, the next live cohort runs from 1st of August 2022, and you can check on the website to subscribe to their educational program. Many thanks for watching, guys. I hope that you enjoy this lecture. Let me know what you think about this. You can always get in touch with me via YouTube, Online Medicine for All Patients, Facebook, Online Medicine, Instagram, Online Medicine, Dr. TS, which is me. And you can always send me an email on this email here that you can see on your screen or access my website and send me a post over there. Let me just see very quickly what we have in the comments here because I wasn't able to read if there are any. Oh, yes, someone was answering the questions. Very well, guys. Well, very well done. Well done. Absolutely. I'm happy. Yeah, the enzymes, cardiac enzymes. Let me just see what was the question here on this So, Can you explain? Explain about Willem Morrow once again. So yes, the Willem Willem Morrow is um, is a common thing that you can hear in emergency departments. Uh, it helps you to assess when there is right bundle or left bundle branch block. So Willem Willem the, the letter W uh, means that there is in V1 the QRS complex looks like the letter W. Let's just go back very quickly to the presentation so I can show you on the picture what exactly it means. There it is. So left bundle branch, we have in V1, the QRS complex looks like W. So this is classic for left bundle branch block with the RS pattern known as the letter W. So that's how it comes from William. So W. And then we have M in the V6, which is our pattern of the QRS complex. And then when you go to the RBB, which means which means right bundle branch block, you have in V1 RSR pattern, which is looking like the letter M. So marrow, and then let me just move my camera from here. And then in the right bundle branch in V6, you have QRS pattern, which looks like the letter W. That's why it is classified as marrow. Um, of course, guys, if you want, I am more than happy to send you this presentation on your emails. The only thing that you need basically to do is let me show you the, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Play from the start. Let me just go back down to the page with contact details. So you can always send me an email and I am more than happy to send this presentation to anyone that is willing to have it in their uh, laptop uh, to use it as a revision tool or anything like this. I am more than happy to do this for you. So just send me an email or send me a message on my Facebook and it will be sorted for you straight away. Let me just see the next question. Yeah, cardiac enzyme. So you were all replying to the answers. Yeah, that's very, very good. ED, okay. No, my, no more questions. I can't see any more. Yes, Janice T, thank you so much. Rinda Goyal as well. Thank you so much, uh, the Madhvi Krishnan as well. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for all the good, good uh, feedback and words that you are leaving in, um, in, in the comment section. Can you please explain question four, why 
it is MI and not pulmonary embolism. So I'm not sure if I need to repeat it. Yeah, I need to because it was posted three minutes ago. So question four. So we have a patient at the age of 74 who is female. So female patient is enough criteria for the development, especially elderly, for development of heart attack. With history of diabetes is another risk factor. And hypertension, given the fact that she has hypertension, means that she has cardiac history. So the, these are three risk factors that this patient has for heart attack. Then she's developing acute chest pain. This is the fourth one. And then we have a history that she suddenly collapsed and died into the ambulance. So sudden onset of deterioration in the hemodynamical stability of the body with further cardiac arrest is most likely due to acute heart attack rather than actual pulmonary embolism, which will come as acute sharp stabbing chest pain. Most, time, most of the times will be worsening on deep breath with normal troponin results in the puff lab and deteriorate its D-dimer. Yes, in this case, we have a very high risk. It's a bit tricky here. I completely agree with you. Paramedics mentioned that she was overweight and recently immobile because of hip pain. So three days is enough to trigger the well score to suspect PE. But in this case, everything else is pointing to MI. So elderly female with diabetes, with cardiac history, sudden collapse, everything leads to cardiac, um, to cardiac condition with rapid onset, which needs to be excluded because of less oxygen to the heart, therefore less oxygen to the brain. Yes, in massive pulmonary embolism, there could be cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest as well. But the question is given with all the keywords that you need to suspect acute myocardial infarction. Elderly female with diabetes, cardiac history, sudden collapse or fainting episode and further cardiac arrest in the ambulance. So this was, everything was in a very, very short period of time. And the acute chest pain is even more putting pressure on everything that comes to deterioration in the heart. So therefore, the most likely cause of the condition will be MI. Obviously, further to that, we can always investigate which artery was occluded and all this stuff. But the most common condition because of all the risk factors. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six risk factors in this case for MI and only one for P for pulmonary embolism. So only recent immob uh, immobilization because of hip pain, but we don't know what kind of immobilization was this. We don't know if it was a fracture, if she was able at all to move because it could be soft tissue injury in 74 year old woman. Trust me, even soft, tish uh, soft tissue injury to the left hip or any hip will be leading to a lot of pain. However, they still can contract the muscles, they can move it. It's not completely immobile. Uh, we don't have um, enough history to, to conclude that this is pulmonary embolism. So six factors, six risk, risk factors for cardiac condition against or versus one for P, we must always draw the line and put as a correct answer MI rather than anything else. Hey, Sanko, sorry to, to jump in. Guys, regarding the fourth question, I just want to mention something here. Um, this is awesome, by the way, one of the Plyverse members. Um, um, so, guys, regarding this question, usually sometimes they don't mention the acute chest pain in the, in the stem of the question. They would just mention that there is a history of sudden death, and then you need to, to suspect what is the most likely cause of death. And the... The possible scenario might be the, the one you mentioned, the acute chest pain, but you need to suspect MI since the patient is diabetic. This is a case of silent MI. This is another form of the question, and this would release some of the confusion 
between PE and MI in this question. So just be aware the the, the takeaway of this question would be um, suspecting silent MI in diabetic patients in case of sudden death, you need to suspect it always, don't miss it out. And yeah, that's it. Thanks, Stanko. No problem. Have you finished, by the way, because if there are no other questions, I am uh, more than happy so we can conclude because we're running out of time already. Uh, I can see so many emails here. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to copy and use all these emails at this time. So please have a look over here. It will be much easier if you send me an email over here and I will make sure that you all will receive that you all will receive the copy of the presentations on your computers. Any other questions, guys? You can all unmute your microphone, so don't worry, you can ask me questions or anything like this. Otherwise, I will be more than happy uh, to conclude this meeting. All right. No other questions? Right, guys, many thanks for your time. Please send me uh, an email. Hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. What is the difference between unstable angina and Prince Ventil angina? How would we I, differentiate it? I couldn't hear very well the question, unfortunately. I'm saying that uh, okay. if you could explain the difference between unstable angina and Prince Ventil angina and how we would differentiate it. So stable, um, stable angina and unstable angina, the stable angina will be coming and going, coming and going every now and then, uh, improving with simple analgesia and GTN. Most of the times it will be self-relieving until the time you see the patient in an actual emergency department. In unstable angina, in unstable angina, we have normal ECG, normal cardiac markers, but the chest pain is always ongoing. So whenever you have ongoing chest pain with normal cardiac markers, you need to suspect unstable angina and refer to the relevant team for further investigations. Hello? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Right, guys. Uh, so rest and like yes, and that's absolutely correct. Um, the rest and simple analgesia relieves stable angina, as I have explained when uh, differentiated between the two conditions in the presentation. So, if there are no other questions, um, obviously you can see my contact details. You can always post me a message. I'm more than happy to provide further ways for communication or discussion with you any type of questions you can ask me anything in an email or message and i will be replying as soon as possible right guys many thanks for your time i will expect your messages and emails and i will see you in the next one all the best bye bye